Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. Before we're joined by our guests today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Just over the last year, the foundation has given over six and a half million dollars in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. So if you are a SAG after artist and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the cast of the hit Peacock show, My New Obsession, Girls by Eva. Please welcome Sarah Bareilles, Renee Elise Goldsberry, Busy Phillips, and Paula Pell. Thank you all so much for being here. Yes, thank, thank you for having you. us. Yes. Um, I'm going to rave a lot about how much I love this show, but before we get there, I actually like to start at the beginning because this is an audience of SAG after actors. Um, how did you get your SAG card? What was the, the job that, that brought that special piece of paper to you? Um, and let's start with Busy. The pilot of Freaks and Geeks. What? Yeah, I had um, been Taft Heart Lead for another job, um, a commercial, I think, when I was in high school in Arizona. And, or maybe I hadn't even been Taft Heart Lead. Anyway, all I know is that I didn't have the money to join SAG because, because I was a college student. I was, 19 years old and a college student. I worked at California Pizza Kitchen. And my manager who had signed me when I moved to Los Angeles, Lorraine Berglund, had paid for my headshots and paid my SAG entrance Good fee. Good for her. Wow. Yeah. I know she was an incredible woman. She actually passed away two years ago of breast cancer. And I was so grateful. We didn't work together for a super long time and she ended up moving back to England, but I kept a little bit in touch with her and I was so grateful to be able to um, really thank her and her family before she passed away for everything that she did for me. So sweet. Wow. Wow. Paula, what about for you? You know, I, when I was out of college and I was in or back in Orlando, I believe I got my, maybe got my SAG card or maybe Taff Hartley during um, I was, had a little teeny part in, a show called Super Force in the 80s. I, I forgot who was in it, but it was kind of like a superhero type thing. And I just remember doing what I did basically in every small part I ever did, just come running out and go, Christine, no! <laughs> that was pretty much my my MO. I was always trying to like, you know, yell to my daughter down the well or like, you know, yelled to my son in a burning building. Um, <laughs> and I also got, um, was the victim in um, uh, America's Most Wanted. That was that was also a, a very intense, a lot of non-comedy things I did a lot of on television, a lot of more uh, small things. But I was, I was in all that on Nickelodeon, but I don't think that was, that was a, a union gig at the time. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Renee, how about for you? Um, I was blessed with a very, very small um, part on a show called An American Dream, the Michael, the, the Jackson 5 story. Wow. Um, I, was at, at, I was at Carnegie Mellon University, and I just think it's just how God blessed my life because I, I was able to graduate with an equity card because I had been in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom at the Pittsburgh Public Theater and um, that SAG ta that SAG Taft Hartley from the fact that there were productions in Pittsburgh and they needed um, uh, some girls to lip sync and to uh, the Supreme song, um, Where Did Our Love Go? Um, in a talent competition where we were, you know, where the Jackson Five beat us. Um, but uh, but yeah, the opportunity to do that and to be able to move to New York and Los Angeles with that card was a dream come true. Wonderful. And Sarah, for you? So I think I got it. I mean, to be honest, I think I'm just, I tried to Google it. I don't know. Um, I think it actually was from performing on daytime TV. So like doing musical performances, you did have to be SAG after for that. So I started, it, it was through music. Um, and so like doing Ellen or 
mm-hmm. you know, the Today Show and stuff like that. So when we were in 2008, when I was um, promoting my first record, that's I've been in the union a lot, lot, lot longer than I've been an actor. <laughs> you were probably already a Grammy nominee by the time you got your SAG card. Maybe right around the same time, actually. Maybe right around the same time. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, um, again, Girls Five Eva is 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 such a joy and so clever. I know it's created by Meredith Scordino, and it counts Tina Fey as an executive producer. I'm sort of curious how you found out about the project and what was your initial response to this premise of a, a 90s girl band making a comeback? And uh, let's start with Paula because I feel like you're, you're you know, I, I don't know if Tina just like calls you and says like, I've got something. <laughs> yeah, you know, the first time I heard about that project was a year before uh, Tina and Meredith. Uh, Tina had always talked to me about Meredith and how much she loved Meredith. And she'd always say, you know, Meredith, right? And I'm like, I know I've met her, but I don't think we really know each other at all. And we never, our paths never really crossed too much at all. And uh, she just used to talk about how much she loved her writing so much and how much she just loved her as a person. And so we went to have sushi in LA with my uh, future wife and the two of them, and they were pitching it. They were in LA pitching it and they were telling me all about it. and, And it was just really making me laugh. And I think at one point, you know, they said, oh, there might be a little part for you. Like they they said something, but I really forgot about it because I really do know from being a writer and having projects how casting goes. And you can have your friends a million times say, I'm writing this thing and I would love for you to be a big part in it. Cut to them not asking you because everyone else around them is like, oh no, you have to get this person because then it'll get made because it's somebody much more famous. So I did not in any way expect it. And I kind of forgot um, because that just became sort of my thing is if anyone mentioned something, I'm like, I will re-remember that. I will remember that when it's real, if it ever comes back around. So um, I was thrilled and she, yeah, she called and, and I think similar to all of us, she called us and said like, hey, you want to do a show during an insane hellscape time? <laughs> um, and, I, and, and I was so thrilled. And when I found out the other three were in it, I, there just wasn't even a question in the world. That's amazing to me because it feels like Gloria was written for you. I mean, you're, your wife plays your ex-wife on the show. Yeah. I think, I think it was inspired by a, a type, you know, by m- maybe I was one of the people that inspired that kind of cadence of Gloria and that kind of way, uh, way that she, she is and the way her funny is. But, um, but I, I, like I said, I, I was never naive about casting and I knew that they would, there would be many uh, attempts to put someone in there that was a big TV star and I was very grateful to to be asked to play this because Paula, it, just newsflash, you are a big TV star. <laughs> just FYI, I, you're like the lead on another show too. So let's I, just I honestly, honestly, like <laughs> I am not I am a working actor ha- happily and can't even believe it that I'm working actor. And I love doing AP bio too and everything, but I am most definitely not like when they're casting stuff, they're not like I'm not one of those like on the top of the list of trying to get it made by casting that person. So I was very grateful to know that they were casting me out of really wanting me to play that part as opposed to wanting it. And also knowing that that will move the needle as they say, but they didn't need to move the needle because it was all the way over. <laughs> Cause that show's so funny. <laughs> and busy. You've been a part of so many great shows. I feel like, uh, it, maybe it's just luck, but I feel like you're really particular about the shows that you sign on to. What what was it about this one? Oh, well, Tina asked me if I wanted to do it. Um, and I love Tina. I've been lucky enough to work with her. Yeah, I guess this is the fourth time that I've worked with her. Um, so anytime, you know, I, I just feel like, especially when you work in comedy and as a, as a, as a woman, uh, you know, you see a lot of like these groups of guys in comedy who like keep hiring the same people and keep their keeping their bros and jobs and stuff. And I didn't really ever feel like I had that. Uh, I wasn't a part, 
I'm not a dude. I, I don't know of the of that kind of thing. And then I did have the realization that I am sort of now one of the people that Tina like has called upon time and time again, which, you know, is the thrill of my life um, because I'm such a huge fan and she's literally the greatest. Uh, and I always respected that about uh, about her and and Paula, like all of your your gang from SNL, you know, all of the women there, Anna and Rachel and and Amy and um, you know Maya. Like I just so at this point in my life and my career, I I'm very particular about acting jobs. It takes so much out of you, and it takes so much time away from my family and my kids are fairly young, but they don't stay that way for very long. And so I'm a little bit of conditions must be perfect actor. And um, that being said, anything Tina asks me to do anywhere, anytime I'll do it. And Renee, what was it like for you to get that call and particularly to play someone who is a oh God, just such a over the top, but lovable diva. I don't know if you know people like this, if you based here on anyone, or what was sort of your reaction to reading about Wiki? Um, my kids are locked out of the room because they would tell you, no, she is that person. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I just had an opportunity to read the pilot script first. Um, and I thought it was so funny and so terrifying to um, see you know, this kind of idea that I had in my head, like, hey, I, I want to be a pop star now, you know, and how old am I? I? I mean, to see to see that, you know, lifted up on on a piece of paper um, so brilliantly, just I just didn't think it could be a coincidence that that, you know, would happen at the same moment in my life as that is as, as the dream that was happening in my life at the same time. So yeah, that, that pilot really was the greatest calling card. And, uh, and then an opportunity to work with Tina and Meredith and Sarah, who was a part of the show when I heard about it, three women who I just think are so powerful. And I just knew there's so much to learn from them. It was a, it was a dream come true. How do you humanize a character like that though? Like we, we love Wiki, but if you think about some of the things she does, it's so terrible. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know that I, I'm, I'm never so worried about humanizing somebody because I life is so I think what, what's what's wonderful about human beings is how flawed they are. And um, mine are so so obvious to me all the time. And uh, and what's beautiful, I think, you know, they're, they're brilliant comedy writers, but baked into these characters is is a uh, is like a certain pain and a certain longing and a certain need uh, and, 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 and a vulnerability, even with the biggest diva in the group, there is such an, she, you know, in the very first episode, they don't hold back. They show immediately how vulnerable and how desperate she is. And so it was very easy to tap into that. And I, I don't know that anybody that's watching this could not relate to somebody who is trying to be an artist and thinks, that maybe they've been lied to their entire life about, you know, how entitled they should be, um, you know, to the idea of this dream coming true and the pain of realizing that. I mean, I think that's something that we can all relate to. And that's why no matter how diva Wiki is, we understand her on some level. So I just, I love the fact that comic writers write real characters. Absolutely. But I, I think also to add to that, sorry, Paula. I no, you, what, you what, I, what I observed as a as a new actor, one of the things that I really appreciated so much about these three women on screen and our other wonderful castmates who also filled out this the world of Girls Five Eva. But there, into nothing got done unless it made sense. Like it really, it, it was like the joke you know, and there wasn't a lot of that in the script. I just mean like, we didn't do a lot just for the gag of it. It all, it, it really did have to like be the Rubik's cube of fitting into their humanity. And I think that was something that I observed everybody really watching for themselves of like, this wouldn't make sense for her. She wouldn't do it this way. You know, like just trying to keep it really grounded in some kind of reality as heightened as it was, but still kind of tethered to reality on some level. Yeah. yeah. I always love, and I, I love the mix of absurd and grounded so much in all shows that I watch. And I, and I feel like 
this show in particular has struck a chord where people love watching it because it doesn't feel like, you know, I know Meredith describes the, the sort of speed at which the, cause it is, it's just breakneck speed of, of hard jokes coming at you. But I always felt from the very first episode that we each, every in between that sea, that beautiful field of hard jokes, there'd be these little moments, whether they're nonverbal or verbal, where we were given a little space as an actor to have a little moment of either fear or sadness, or, you know, even with my, with my uh, storyline with my ex-wife of just like realizing and having that speech of coming back and going, you guys weren't even there for me. Like it, 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 it just makes you feel that, that tightness in your throat of, of emotion because we were living through and are still living through like this crazy, absurd time in real life. And, and life is absurd. There's insane things that happen to all of us all the time. And so it, it just f- felt very authentically character uh, driven. And, and I love that. And it can be in the same scene. Like one moment I'm laughing hysterically about an invisible piano. And then it's this beautiful metaphor for, you know, why she needs to hold on to it. And, you know, I, I was really hoping actually you would have the invisible piano behind you, but maybe you oh, do. It's there. <laughs> I knew it. I'm gonna play it for. I'm gonna play us out. I'm gonna play us out. You know what's so funny about that piano? I I just moved back to the East Coast and I really wanted to get a piano, uh, like a baby grand or something. And 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 a couple of people were going, "You should get that. You should get that uh, clear piano from them." Like from the you know, I look up that piano. It's like the price of my house. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I I ain't getting that piano. <laughs> Um, Sarah, I'm curious because I've been fortunate enough to I see you on stage a couple times, actually. And so I knew what a fantastic actor you were. But I think people were almost a little surprised because you're you're such a good singer. It's almost not fair that you can act and do comedy, <laughs> too. Um, and your first series out of the gate, you know, you're, you're the lead in a Tina Fey produced show. Um, was there any fear or hesitation in sort of taking on this role? Oh, my God, yes. Well, are you crazy? Yes, I yes, yes. Terrible trepidation. But what I have learned to do, and this is good advice that I've been given along the way, is like you have to believe the people that believe in you. And Tina Fey is not going to hand me some shit that she thinks I really can't do. So I look up to her and I believe in her taste. And so that was part of you know, taking a big leap of faith. And I have made decisions, you know, as an artist in the last, mm, I don't know, maybe the last six or seven years, I keep going towards the things that I find to be a little more fear inducing, because I find that as a human being, those are the spaces I'm actually experiencing the most growth and the most satisfaction frankly I just I I don't have a lot of interest in sort of swimming in familiar waters because I don't find that the part of me that gets activated and feels creative and that part of me that wants to reach for something is a more interesting place to be as an artist so um the scary thing is that you know you're not gonna come out the gate being what you hopefully will grow into um and feeling safe to make mistakes and I was in wonderful hands you know a- across the boards my scene partners in every single scene in, in of this show were so loving generous capable human beings who were always encouraging me to like you can do this you can do this but I had I've I've cried at each and every one of these women and <laughs> you know, like yes plenty of fear plenty of trepidation but I'm sort of of the mindset that you have to feel the fear and do it anyway. There's but a book Janelle, about it. But Janelle, I have to say, just as somebody who I've done this for a really long huh, huh, we already went over it, but <laughs> I've done this for a really long time. Part of what we were sort of up against a little bit was the filming during COVID and all of the protocols put in place. So while this may be Sarah's first television show, this was definitely Paula and Renee and my first television show filming during a pandemic yes and and also things that previously i had just completely taken for granted like 
I came to work one day and Sarah had been doing a chunk, a big chunk of scenes with uh, Daniel Breaker, who's the incredible actor that plays her husband on the show. And she had not eaten anything, had not like had a snack because you, we take for granted, literally take for granted craft services. Yeah. And like the fact that you grab peanuts, you know, while you're ru rushing to the bathroom and to come back, you know, to finish filming the scene. And she was like, I'm really gonna be like pass out. <laughs> like, yes, you know, and, it, and that's kind of like, and we all sort of experienced different versions of that thing. It made it very challenging in part. I mean, we- Not to mention some people are emotion, not me, but some pe people are emotional eaters. So while you're performing, if, you know, it's getting, it's getting <sighs> nerve wracking or you're nervous about learning something or you wanna really nail, nail something, um, you want, you're used to just grabbing a little something and you're just always snacking. And when there wasn't, wasn't really much of that, that was, that was when I, I started noticing the, you know, I get the kind of either vacant, like stare off of like, oh my God. And, and all those, just all those differences, like we've talked about, you know, rehearsing dance with a mask on for three hours it's and rehearsing it, the, the scene with yeah. that. So the, think, like at the, and comedy through a mask are extremely challenging. I can tell yeah. you. That. I yes. remember our first scene that we shot together. Well, Renee, I don't you wait. Was Renee or was pa anyway, I? Was not there. You were not in it. Yeah, it was the three of us. It was Sarah and Paula, and me. That was my first scene. And Jonathan, um, who plays our old manager, and. I was all of a sudden, I'm like, I can't see these people's faces. I couldn't remember my lines. Like, I was like, what is happening to me? I guess I've lost it, you know? And then turns out you just have to take the mask off. It's fine. It's also getting any direction from someone who is not only in a mask, but also in a face shield. It's <laughs> disorienting and you're like, where is the sound coming from and who yes. is talking to me? And I can't, I can't hear well anyway. So having masks and not being able to like look at people's uh, mouths when they're talking and and not knowing whether they're sneering at you behind the mask. <laughs> the I joy, mean, the joy. Um, I think I think we. It's kind of a bit like high, high altitude training to go through as long as we did with masks on and separated from each other, even on set. You know, and then between action and cut to take the mask off yes. and get to be with each other. I think that is one of the reasons people say, you know, why is the show doing so well? There's a million reasons, but one of them has to be how much we appreciated just being able to be on a set together, even if we weren't talking, whether we were singing, whether we were dancing, just to be together was, um, we were so grateful and we so appreciated in a way that we never had before. And I, I, I believe, I see it. I see that, that that's part of the chemistry of the show. I think we didn't have the normal amount of the such what I find so fun about acting in between is the time in between when you sit next to each other and you're waiting for the next setup and you're really getting to know each other and you're really bonding and, you know, oh my God, did you sit, here's my dog and blah, blah, blah. You know, oh my, this is my daughter. Like everyone's always looking at each other's phones and in each other's, oh, let me taste that. Like it's very intimate and we didn't have any of that because we kind of had to like go in our dressing rooms and kind of sit far away from each other. So when we were unmasked and on camera, we were just in between any second we could. It's like, oh, remind me to tell you this. <laughs> like we were just like little mice all the time that we're always like whispering to each other. And because we finally got a chance to communicate, you know, it was real sweet. Did any of you know each other before the show began? Because the chemistry is so ingrained and it feels instantaneous. I knew I knew Renee through sisters and uh, through co-op, which were, you know, collectively not that many days together. And in, in sisters, there were 150 people there. So I didn't really spend too much time with her co-op. We spent an intense two or three days together eating dinners with Richard Kine and laughing our ass off. And to, to know amazing. Paula for one hour is <laughs> You know, there's, that's like, I mean, the beauty of her is um, that's about all you need. She will tell you everything about herself and <laughs> she will I'll, love you. I'll, you MRIs. I'll, I'll really yeah. go deep. Yeah. But she'll love and, you completely in that amount of time. It's, it's a beautiful gift. And, and, and I, and I can say that the same about the rest of them now having had an opportunity to spend this time with them. I mean, it didn't, 
it was it didn't take more than an hour to know that you know I had struck gold with these women. I only knew I only knew Busy through being on her talk her wonderful talk show for Wine Country. That was kind of the only time I've ever really ever spent with Busy, right? Busy? Yes, but I was like, no, you were in an entire series with me and you never spoke to me. I that's true. I no, but I was I'm such I was such a huge fan of Paula's and and actually it's totally right. You did you were just on the wine country episode of Busy Tonight. All the ladies were but like, I felt like you left and I was like, oh, Paula is my new best friend. No, we <laughs> felt I like did. we bonded on there because we did a lot of we games did. and activities and we drank and everything. And then Sarah, I did not know at all, even though I absolutely adored her work. And she came in with these little 90s pigtails into oh my, my dressing room and stood in the doorway the first day. And I was in the dressing room kind of nervous, you know, getting myself together and this mask, these pigtails. And she's like, hi. And I'm like, hello. I had no <laughs> idea who it was. And I'm like, oh. I just thought it was like somebody on the crew that was saying hi, you know, that's going to work with me. And I was like, and she she said, oh, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I don't know if you said big fan, but you said I'm a fan or whatever. And I go, oh, thank you. That's so sweet. No. <laughs> just didn't even say it back because I didn't know who it was. And then we go to shoot the next scene and I see the pigtails from her from behind. And I was like, that was Sarah. <laughs> oh, on, Paula. I've ruined my first meet cute with Sarah no, Morales. It's a better story this way. I love it. It's so good. <laughs> I mean, I it might have worked out. I would be very intimidated. I have there's no one I karaoke more than Sarah Bareilles. So <laughs> I, I feel like maybe that's a good way to have an intro. Wow. And and I'm not a good singer, so I apologize. I usually make people sing one of my what's my what's your favorite song of mine? Brave. <laughs> In fact, I'll do it now. No, I won't do it. Um, actually, this is something I'm really curious about because I know we're we're you know sort of having a return to normal, but uh, the show has already become so popular. It's been out a little less than a month. Are you at that point yet where people are coming up and and quoting it to you? Are they saying you know cease and desist or <laughs> you know it's, is, have you realized that it's become part of the pop culture vernacular already? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's I right. have it, but I, definitely people, I, 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 I tend to think if anyone's doing it, it's because they're my friend. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, um, you know, it's, I, I remember in Hamilton, uh, Philippa Sue said one time about, you know, people used to always ask us, you know, um, did you know it was going to be this successful? Did you know it was going to be this great? And she had this really brilliant answer. She was like, you know, we feel this way about everything we do. <laughs> it's ju it just happens to be that this time it seems like more people agree with us. Um, and uh, I just, I take that with me everywhere because it, it's absolutely true. Everything feels that way. This definitely feels that way. So I, uh, I tend to try to keep my, my expectation down in terms of people feeling that something I'm a part of is as iconic as I think it is. <laughs> um, um, but I, but I, I can't believe, and I love the fact that I did this show because I just believed in it. And I thought it was a beautiful thing to do in that season of COVID and life. And um, and the joy that it gave me is so contagious and that there, and that when people do quote a line to me, it is always a different line. You know, there are so much quotable about this show that every single person says something to me different that they love. And that's just as a testament to the writers of the show. They're brilliant. Agreed. <laughs> we have so many actors watching us, obviously, and uh, Girls 5 Eva, really, it, it really does, you know, deal with some dark material about how women in particular ha can be treated in this business and, and how challenging it is. And I'm curious, um, as, you know, successful artists, um, if there was ever a time that you, you know, sort of came up against a struggle that made you consider leaving the business and sort of how you push through that. Janelle, I wrote a whole book about it. I know, I've read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so pick one. <laughs> I mean, uh, losing the job after I had my first child because the network said I was too big, I was too fat, fat was the word they <laughs> that came back to me, um, was really, really disheartening. And I cried for days. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got Cougar Town, so, you know. 
Yeah. You keep going. Like it's, you know, I mean, very soon after, maybe two months after uh, that had happened. And I remember being so uncomfortable about my body because I had obviously just lost this job. Anyway, I was wearing like, I was like double, sp I had like Spanx on from my pinky toe to like right below my ears, like, you know, for my network uh, callback, you know, the test for my network test. And I said something to Bill Lawrence, the creator of the show about my bot. I was like, I just, you know, just so you know, I can like lose more weight, like just, you know, and he was like, what, wait, what, what are you talking about? Literally, what are you talking about? And I was like, it's just, I just, you know, Birdie is only five and a half months old and I did gain a lot of, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I'm married to an actor, right? You know that Krista's had three of my three children, like, you look amazing. I didn't, I, no one's talking about that. And I was like, oh, okay, I can breathe. I can go in and do this job. But that, you know, it's hard. It is hard when you, you know, and I hope that things have changed. I think that just even in the last five years, we've seen more representation of all kinds uh, on TV and in movies. And I think changing the conversation is important. And I hope that we continue to do that especially so that more actors and performers who want to be a part can, you know, join us, you know, can come in and, and, and then it's, and then it's not just like you're casting, you know, the same person over and same, over. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, thanks Renee. Thank you. Thanks for taking over. I'm unpacking right now. Cause I moved and I found all these old headshots and going down the, cause I was an actor for, you know, the first 30, whatever, 31 years of my life. And then I went to SNL for almost 20 years and occasionally acted, but pretty much like put that away. And when I, about 10 years, uh, about 12 years ago, I did a pilot for, for NBC and, and it was about weight and it was about two sisters that uh, grew up fat and one got thin called thick and thin. And the process, even though I was the, the writer of it, the process of watching us cast it and the so much horrible shit that was still going on at the time um, that just broke my heart where I'd find somebody that was like saying my words and kind of, cause it was kind of based on me and my sister and like, playing like doing the jokes and doing the 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 emotional stuff exactly how I intended it writing wise acting wise to hear that in a casting and just be like oh my god this is happening like we found it we found it we found the person and then to talk to executives where they were like yeah I think we should use this thinner person and I it was suggested to me to pad them to pad a thinner person to play the fat part a, as a legitimate suggestion to me on a big show and it was such a constant as a person of size it was a constant reminder to me that I'm wrong that I'm another that I am not acceptable on television and so I'm now I'm sitting watching these young girls come in reading my words and so excited about doing this these parts and then it, these these guys watching them audition and like looking at their stomach while they're auditioning or looking at their body. And it, it's disgusting, you know, and not, it's still a hundred percent still swimming around in the sea of show business, but it, at least there is some semblance now of like reference of like shrill and all these shows where there's young, cause we were trying to cast a young big woman and it was like, they were like, Oh, we want somebody that's really done a lot. And it's like, guess what? You don't ever cast young, big women like you don't cast 20 year old young, big women in anything on television ever at that time. So it was hard to find people that had a resume that they thought was good enough, you know, in terms of it's because they would never cast them. So it really killed my heart for a while and really messed me up because it made me feel like there were rules that were impenetrable for who I am to even, you know, enjoy doing it. Um, theater wasn't like that. Theater didn't feel like that ever to me, you know, I'm sure it is in the deeper parts of it, but it didn't feel like that to me as much as that camera, you know, film and TV with fat. But I will, Janelle, can I just say this? Because I know there are so many actors that are watching and I know that this is really, this is hard. 
to hear. But you're at a really, it, it's, it's one of the hardest times to break into this industry, but it's also one of the most expansive times to break into this industry. If you don't, if you're like, I don't write, I can't write, I don't want, I don't, I'm not a person who writes things. Find a writer <laughs> who you can work with. Like you have, you have the ability, you know, use Instagram, like use those, use those things. Use those things. I know people who've been cast off of in doing characters on Instagram. And, you know, I think that that's part of why the landscape has been able to shift is all of these other ways to be seen and be validated and be seen for your talent. And I would just, it, it's, it's, you know, I never, I never did it. I never was the one that was like, I'm going to like write the thing. Well, I tried to, that's also in my book guys. You can just read my book, but, um, <laughs> but I, that would be like my biggest advice to people who are trying and feeling as though they just keep coming up against a wall, which is that like you are at a unique time in that you, you can sort of forge your own path. And if you're like, I'm a dramatic actor, I mean, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know. I'm not, I don't, I don't have advice for that guys. I don't know. <laughs> no, but I also think people can now look to people like Paula, who, you know, is so beautiful and funny and, you know, fierce on this show. You know, I mean, I've been following your career for a long time. So I, I would see you in like little sketch, little bits of Saturday night live, you know, and you just, you're a star. So I think it's like great to have people, you know, be able to, to look at a hit show where you're killing it. Well, when I mentioned those headshots, I found a headshot that it was, I had lost a hundred pounds about three times in my life, 190 and 80, I think. And, and they were within six years of each other. And, and I have this headshot of me after losing a hundred pounds and I'm just like, and I mean, I, I look at first glance, you're like, oh, that I looked really good because I was just very chiseled and very like, you know, but I looked so dead eyed. But also as an actor, a young actor, I was then only going on auditions for like the, the young wife of a young child and a bank commercial, or it wasn't the stuff that I loved. It wasn't, it wasn't character stuff. It wasn't like earthy character shit that my comedy worked well with. And, and, and it's like, you'd fight to be looking like something that people tell you you should do. So you'd get more successful to be successful in something that you don't even want to do. It's such a strange right. world. So now I think speaking to what Busy's saying is to embrace who you are right now in your body, what makes you feel funny and what makes you, how you like looking and then find the ways to have people see that as opposed to try to change what you look like to make you look like someone else. Cause that doesn't, I'm sure Sarah can speak to that musically is like trying to sound like other people or it's just, that's not the way, you know, that's not the way to do it. Even speak yeah. to the appearance stuff. Of I think, especially as women, I think we, we just get, we get put through this machine. I have endless stories of starting with my very first TV appearance where I, I had picked out a thing to wear and I showed up and there was something else there that the label had decided I was going to wear something else than the thing I had picked up. And let me tell you who lost their shit. Mm -hmm. And I think what to the two, what I want to say is that I'm so grateful. I didn't give up. I'm so grateful that it only ever sort of sharpened my resolve and made me super stubborn and probably kind of an asshole to work with. For a long I time. love all three of you so much because you're all so clear on who you are and what bullshit you will not take. I'm just going to yeah, say that. I think that's and like, you know Janelle, I don't know you well enough, but I'm I not, I'm right. not in fairness. So I'm I working on it. <laughs> I think we're all always working on it, but I'm so, I'm so glad to have metabolized those experiences as something that only sharpened what felt, in alignment for me and no, and it doesn't mean I didn't make lots of mistakes. I have plenty of stories about that too, but you know, we're just, we're, we're, we're working out. We're doing our best busy. We're doing our best. Yeah. That's my, the name of my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I love, um, you know, as a, as an actress of color, people ask me all the time, you know, can you talk about experiences and frustrations you've had and discrimination coming up in the business? And, um, I think maybe because, uh, 
I've been a person of color. Um, so, you know, my, the discrimination I, I felt wasn't specific to acting. Um, I already, you know, kind of, you know, was operating and living in a world where I kind of understood, you know, what I was going to get in terms of opportunity. And, and I had made some decisions about how I was not going to react to that, how I was not going to feel more competitive with other women of color, but actually lift them up. Like I'd already made some decisions. So those things were a little easier for me to, to manage. I think what I love so much about Girls 5 Eva is um, the thing I found the most challenging, the elephant in the room was aging. Mm -hmm. As a woman aging in this business um, felt like something... I had less control over than um, anything else, even though clearly I'm not going to not be black. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And, um, and, and that's what I love about this show and the um, audacity of these women to cast for women, you know, in this age group um, and not deep fake us when we're playing that we're 20 years old, <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, like to, to let us play in this realm at this age. My hope is that it, it is an example. I hope my career is an example. I hope this show is an example. And the fact that this is happening, that, that women of this age get to have this fun and, and get to be on this press tour. I hope it is an example to all of the people because ageism is not something that only affects women. All of the people in this industry, whether they're actor, whatever side of the camera that they're on, that they still recognize their relevance in the industry and that they still keep asking or listening to the part of them that says, I have more to do. I have more, there's more sides of me. I, I still matter. My, my, my craft still needs to be developed. There's, there's more here. Um, th that's what I hope this show is an example of that. That's my prayer. And, uh, to add on to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just said, I love that. No, um, and uh, Renee, I have to say, I've watched your Tony speech whenever I'm feeling a little down and it, it, it <laughs> reinforces everything you just said, which I love. And I am so sorry we're out of time because I could obviously go on for hours. Um, but I do want to thank you so much for being here, for sharing your experiences with your fellow actors. And again, congratulations on a fantastic show. Hey, thank you so uh, much. Well, thanks for the support of it. And we are so excited people are enjoying it.